Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Nat Colson. I'm a photographic artist based in England. Today, we'll be talking about how to get consistent color in your digital photography. Maybe to start, just a little bit of background. Um, I started my career working in printing and digital imaging in the late 1980s when I was still in high school. And during the 1990s, I worked through the earliest days of digital color systems. Back then, managing digital color was challenging, to say the least. Um, around 2003, uh, I started my fine art photography business about 15 years ago now. And I produce fine art prints that are used as interior decor. These days, it's much, much easier for photographers and artists to get consistent results uh, using uh, contemporary um, color systems. But unfortunately, this all still remains a mystery for most people. So this is what we'll be covering today. This webinar is designed for all photographers working with digital images. So whatever kind of photography you're doing and whatever you like to shoot and whatever equipment that you're using, uh, this should be relevant for everybody looking to reproduce your work with the best quality. And if you're struggling to get results that you're happy with, then my hope is that by the time we're done today, you'll have some of the answers to get you moving in the right direction. So let's just talk about today's program. Uh, we're going to take a look at what it takes uh, to achieve the best possible print quality. We'll talk about sharing images on screen, and that uh, covers a couple of different aspects, so I'll get more into that. We'll review the basic digital photo workflow and the steps required and how managing color relates to this. I will explain some of the most essential bits about color management. Now, for those of you who haven't heard this term before, um, it can be a little bit daunting at first, but my aim is to make it as simple and as straightforward as possible. So I'm going to just be covering kind of the most important pieces. Uh, in this webinar, we're not going to be getting really too deep into the technical aspects of color management. Rather, I'll be explaining the components or the pieces of the system that every photographer really needs to know and understand. We'll talk quite a bit about display calibration and profiling. Um, display being your computer monitor that you're using to view and edit your photos. Calibrating and profiling your display is by far the most important step in starting to get a handle on managing your color for your photography. We'll take a quick tour around some of the software settings in Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, these two programs differ a little bit in the way that they handle color, uh, although both of them will ultimately produce the same quality output. Um, those, the settings and the way that you access those settings are a little bit different. We'll talk a bit about printer profiles. Now, I'm going into this with a bit of assumptions here that most photographers want to print their photos at some point. Um, as, as someone with a long background in printing, I really believe in the importance and the relevance of printing. For that matter, photography in a, in a large degree really is about making that final print. So. We'll look at what a printer profile is, how it works, and why it uh, is so important to your digital workflow. And then towards the end, I will leave some time for Q&A. So I've actually just noticed a little mistake here. I've mentioned about the chat box here. Um, ignore that. In fact, on your webinar controls, you have a box actually for questions. And so that's where your questions need to go. Uh, the chat box is not really in use for this session. So just to be clear, type your questions into the questions box and they will be compiled. And at the end, I will hopefully have time to pick out three or four and uh, get a little bit deeper in uh, to areas that people want to know about. So let's take a look at the main problem here. Inconsistent, unpredictable color. So obviously photography has a lot of different sort of moving parts to it. 
You know, you've got your working with the camera and getting the files into your computer and editing through them and choosing the best ones. And then, of course, enhancing or adjusting or processing those pictures. And then ultimately some type of output. And we're going to talk about each aspect of this. But the thing that I want to make clear here is that without putting a few systems in place, and without having some procedures that you're constantly following, that your color will be inconsistent and unpredictable. And what that means is that when you're printing or sharing your images, that you're gonna get a lot of surprises, and normally those are not nice surprises. So we're gonna try and tame all of this. So looking deeper at the problem, the first thing that I encounter often with people is that prints are coming out too dark or the colors aren't right. Now, you may be printing yourself. Hopefully, a large percentage of you are, um, you know, printing with a good quality inkjet printer uh, at home or in your studio. If you're not, then I would encourage you to consider it because making your own prints is one of the, the most uh, rewarding and, uh, and um, interesting parts of, of doing photography. But even if you're printing yourself, you may be finding that when you make your prints that it doesn't look like what you thought it would. The problems, I think, get a little bit more mysterious and maybe more frustrating when you're sending files to a lab for printing. And by a lab, I mean any sort of printing service bureau where you're maybe uploading files online uh, using uh, a website or some software or you're sending people a disk or a flash drive full of pictures to print. When you're handing off your files for someone else to print, your management of color becomes that much more important because you don't have any control over how they're going to manage color. And obviously you want to be working with service providers who do have good color management policies and we'll look a little bit about what that means. Aside from printing your photographs, the other thing that probably people do far more even is sharing them online. So whether you're uploading files to Facebook or Instagram or so other social media sites or sharing them on Flickr or SmugMug or other file uh, photo sharing websites, anytime that you're having your pictures viewed on screen, you have sort of a different set of considerations than when you're printing. And we'll look at why that is and, and you know how you would handle these situations a little bit differently. For now, let's just make a clear distinction between printing your photos versus sharing them in such a way that they're projected or viewed on a screen, because that's the, the two main um, characteristics that you're going to encounter. So looking at print quality, we need to first address this whole idea of trying to match the print to your screen. When I present to camera clubs and lead workshops and even working one-to-one -one with people, one of the first things that people say is, why doesn't my print match my screen? Well, there's a number of reasons for this. And we need to sort of distill this down into a few key concepts here so you understand what's really achievable. First, consider that a display screen, a computer monitor or a phone or a tablet, any kind of a device with a screen on it, is outputting your photograph using transmitted light. Okay, so the, the light is coming out from the device itself. On a print, everything that you can see on that sheet of paper is reflected light. And so the, the essential characteristics of these two things are very different. So maybe set aside for a moment the idea that you can exactly match your screen to the print because they're two different animals. What you can do, though, is set up systems where your screen can be showing you the best possible approximation to what the print might look like given a set of circumstances or conditions that you determine. You can also train your eye. 
and this is something that I'll try and come back to a few times here, that a lot of managing color comes down to learning to understand what it is that you're actually seeing. So when you look at something on screen, you have a clear idea of what that might translate to on somebody else's screen or on a print. So with print quality, the main thing that we struggle with are issues of tone and contrast. Now in this context, when I refer to tone, I'm talking about brightness, levels from black to white and everything in between, and contrast being the varying shades of gray. Okay, so tone and contrast. And when somebody says, my print is too dark, this typically is what we're, we're talking about. It's a tone problem. Color is a separate issue altogether. If your prints are coming out with a color cast or a tint to them that looks not like what you thought, then that is a separate matter from tone and contrast. So in color, we're looking for accuracy, right? So that the print really is showing the true colors as are represented within the digital image file. And then of course, the balance between colors. You don't want your oranges and reds to be far off in accuracy where your blues and greens are more accurate. Saturation refers to how pure or vivid the colors are. Sometimes when you make a print, it'll come out being more or less vivid than what you thought. And that again gets back to how accurate is your screen preview. The other thing to keep in mind about printing quality which you can never really get away from, are the characteristics of the media. And in this case, by media, I mean paper, or canvas, or fabric, or wood, or metal, or whatever kind of material that you're printing on. Print media is gonna be the main determining factor of what colors are possible, and how accurate your print can even be. But then beyond that, you also have concerns about the lighting and the viewing conditions you've probably encountered a situation where you have a print, whether you've made it yourself or got it from a lab, and you look at it under one lighting source and it looks a certain way, and then you look at it in another light and it looks different. So these are all considerations that you need to keep in mind when you're working through the issues of color management and trying to sort of tighten the screws to get things in line to where you want. With print quality, the most important thing at the end of the day is that when you're working on your picture on the monitor, that you have a real accurate idea of what it will look like when it's printed before you actually print it. We don't want to be in a situation where we're making lots and lots of test prints uh, and then adjusting our monitor to match the print. That's exactly backwards. So we want to instead get to an accurate preview on our screen and train our eye to understand what we're looking at so that when we send it off either to a lab or make our own print that we know what it'll look like with some reasonable certainty and it is achievable. So sh sharing photos online or on any other screen is a whole different set of considerations. So we need to start with what's a realistic expectation Okay, even if your color management is locked down tight and your system is all good, sort of, you know, closed loop, self-enclosed, you're reproducing color accurately. When you release a file out into the wild, you have no control over how it's going to be viewed. Full stop. End of story. If you put a photo on Facebook, there's no way that you can ensure that somebody is going to see it the way that you want. And that's because you have no control over their screen and their device. So everything about viewing an image on screen is all about the characteristics and the settings for that particular device. With that said, there are some things that you can do to uh, ensure that it's going to be acceptable at the very least. First, keep in mind that all screen displays are different whether it's an old style CRT monitor or an LCD or LED display or a smartphone or tablet device. All of these are different machines and we, I think we can all sort of understand that they're gonna have different characteristics. 
The main thing about accuracy with sharing your images online, though, is to keep in mind that most of the people looking at your pictures are not using any sort of color management. This gets back to what I was saying about even if your color management's good, you post it online and a bunch of people are looking at it on their phone, on their computer, on their laptop, on their TV, they're not using color management. And so the display of your image is going to be entirely driven by the settings that you use in creating that image file. The other thing to keep in mind with uploading pictures, especially to social media, is that your files might and actually most likely are being altered. When you upload files to Facebook or Instagram or most of the other social media platforms, your image file is actually being altered when it's being uploaded. And again, you don't have any control over that. So the idea here is that we want to get control of what we can. And then the things that you can't control, well, just forget about it because it's not worth worrying about. Key principle number one here, if you're uploading pictures to be viewed on screen, whether it's your own website or WordPress blog or a file sharing website or any social media, make sure that your file is saved as sRGB. OK, and we're going to look at what that means a little bit more in a second. OK, but just keep in mind, sRGB is for screen viewing. The solution to all of this is implementing color management and color management refers to a system that has several parts to it. But one of the most important pieces is a measurement device of some type. And there's a range of these on the market. The picture here is the i1 Studio, which is a recent model color management system put out by x -Rite. And this is the one that I'm currently using and really like. I get on well with this. And I've been using x -Rite and other products for decades, literally. And this is a very, very good solution. So we're going to dig into what is color management and how can you get it working for you. Let's first review what is the digital photography workflow. First, you're going to capture the images. And this is referring to a, uh, a device of some kind, mainly a camera or possibly a smartphone or you know a tablet, something with a camera. Capture it. Then you download it onto a hard drive or a computer somewhere. If you're capturing something with your phone, it's automatically downloaded onto the device. After you've downloaded the pictures, then you're going through and organizing them. And any working photographer knows that when you go out taking pictures, you come back with lots and lots of image files. Well, these need to be organized in some fashion and decide which are the good ones and which can you ignore. After organizing, then we process. And processing is enhancing, uh, including things like cropping and straightening, uh, changing to black and white, or adjusting color or dodging and burning using other localized adjustments. OK, this is all processing. And then last but not least, we come to output. And output is what you do after you would say the picture is finished. Note the stars next to four of these five, where using color management is absolutely essential if you want to get reliable results, OK? In all honesty, copying your files from one media to another or the download stage, that's the only part really where you're not too concerned about color management. The rest of it requires color management. So looking at some fundamentals here, a color management system is a set of software that runs on your computer. It's a CMS. It's built into your OS. It's built into Macs and Windows. On the Mac, it's called ColorSync. On Windows, older versions uh, used to be called ICM. Now it's WCM, Windows Color Management. And the color management system uses what's referred to as color spaces. If you look at the image on the upper right, you'll see that this is a, a 3D graphical representation of a, a color space. And you can also see that color spaces have uh, different sizes and shapes and can actually be plotted as a three-dimensional volumetric 
view, okay? So the outside bit that's shown overlaid in white is a bigger color space than the one inside. Pretty simple. A color space defines what colors are actually possible either for a device or for an image file. And this is referred to as the gamut. So a small color space has a small gamut and a larger one has a large gamut. There are overlaps. There are some colors that are going to exist in multiple color spaces and other colors that only exist in certain color spaces. Another way to look at this is that if you're looking at your photo on your phone or on a desktop computer monitor, if they look different, part of the reason might be that they'd have different color gamuts. Those different devices have actual the ability to display the photos actually in separate colors. So the way that the color management system processes your image file to the appropriate gamut uses profiles. And profiles are an essential part of the color management system in that it handles the translation of color from one device to another. So if you're viewing your photo on your laptop screen and then you print it to your desktop printer, you're potentially going to be implementing two different color profiles. You've got a color profile for your monitor and a color profile for your printer. A color space describes the gamut of either, sorry, the profile des describes either the color space or the device gamut. So there's some examples of profiles here on the bottom right. The Adobe RGB profile that's listed at the top is the outer space on the image at the upper right, the, the grayed out uh, ghosted white area. That's the Adobe RGB space. Down at the very bottom, you see the sRGB color space. That's the one inside it. Okay, so you can see literally that the Adobe RGB color space is bigger than the sRGB color space. Each device has its own profile. So your desktop display has a profile and you can see here in the profiles list that I've got two display profiles for the PA241W, which is my NEC display. And I have two profiles simply because they were created on two different dates. Okay, the first one shows the date in the file name. So a display has a profile, a printer has a profile, image files can also have profiles, and they should. Whenever you're working with a digital photograph and you're sharing it or sending it or saving it somewhere else, you need to know what color space it's in and you need to embed the profile for that color space. Far and away, the most important element of managing your color is to calibrate and profile your display. Now, it's important to understand that not all, all monitors or all displays are not created equal. There's a reason why some displays are 100 pounds and others are 2,000 pounds. And not every color computer monitor is capable of reproducing accurate color. So you get what you pay for, and you can expect that with better quality displays, you have more accurate color. Unfortunately, the fact also is that your laptop monitor is not ever going to show as accurate a color as a, dis a uh, desktop display can do. Okay? Desktop displays have more controls, and they're designed more to be adjustable to become more color accurate. For years and years, I have used and sworn by ISO and NEC displays uh, over the last year or two. BenQ are making really excellent displays for photographers. The main thing about these displays, and if you're looking for a new display, what you're looking for is that you can adjust brightness and contrast independently, and that you can also adjust your red, green, and blue as separate levels. Unfortunately, there are a lot of displays on the market, even marketed for photography, that don't actually allow you to set individual levels for red, green, blue, right? And you can probably imagine how if you're trying to set a color neutral or balanced white point, that having 
the ability to adjust the three channels independently is crucial. The only way to generate an accurate view on your screen is to use a profiling kit, like the one shown in this picture. That is the X-Rite i1 Studio, where I showed you a picture of on the earlier slide, and that is in place on the monitor taking a measurement of the screen. If you don't use a device to measure the output of your screen, you cannot hope to uh, obtain a accurate profile. When you attach the device to your computer and put it on your monitor, it just runs through the software, measures a bunch of color charts, and then generates a profile that uses uh, the, the color management system uses to display accurate color. The idea here is that the device is measuring the characteristics of your display and then the profile is used by the CMS to correct for the characteristics of your display. So this is the only way that you can be sure of accurate color on your monitor. We're going to take a break from the uh, slides here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to switch over into some software settings and talk about how some of these settings uh, influence your uh, quality and the output of your photos. We're going to take a quick look at Photoshop color settings, which these are the settings just here to the right. We're going to look at some preferences uh, for the Lightroom external editor. We're going to talk about embedding profiles in image files. we we'll talk briefly about color space conversions. And that's going to be most important when you're preparing files to send to a lab and when you're preparing files for web. Okay. So I'm going to hide out of this for a moment. Bear with me. So we'll look at Photoshop first. Okay. In Photoshop, what you're seeing on screen are rendered pixels. This is an important distinction. When we zoom into the image, you can see the pixels. Each one of these pixels has a very specific numeric value. And that numeric value contains information about the brightness and the color of that pixel. So if we look back at the whole image, you can imagine that we have literally many, many thousands or millions of pixels, all with a different color value. Now, this numeric value is a fixed number. That number remains the same on your computer and on somebody else's computer and on the lab's printer. It's all just down to how the different devices actually translate that numeric value into the output. So if you keep in mind that your image has a set of fixed numeric values in it. Color management is really all about how those numbers are translated onto different devices, whether it be a display or a projector or a printer. So in Photoshop, this image file, which is uh, saved on the hard disk as a TIFF file or a PSD, this has a color space associated with it. And this color space can be found under Convert to Profile. Okay, I'm using a Mac here, but this is the same on Windows. You go under the Edit menu, go to Convert to Profile, and you can see what is the current source space. So this image file is using the Adobe RGB color space. If I upload this onto Facebook using the Adobe RGB color space, there's a good chance that colors will shift and it will not look the way I intended. So I would want to convert it using this convert to profile, convert it to the destination space. When you convert to the destination space, Photoshop will translate all of the color values from the pixels and make sure that it fits within the destination space. 
as I said earlier, sRGB is the one you want to use for sharing online and for projection or if you're looking at it on your TV. So don't use Adobe RGB for your images for display. Now, conversely, if you're having your photos printed on an inkjet printer, like a fine art print on photo paper or fine art paper or canvas, then use RGB, Adobe RGB. We'll come back to that in a second. So if I wanted to convert this to sRGB, I do have the ability to get a preview to see if there are going to be any color shifts. And when I check and uncheck check this preview box, I can see that the color shifts are so minor that it's inconsequential. I can actually see that in these greens here, there is a very, very slight shift, but it's nothing I'm concerned about. So I'm happy to go ahead and convert it here. When you save your file from Photoshop, if I do a save as and go to my desktop here, down at the bottom, we see this option for embed color profile. Absolutely crucial that you always do that. Make sure that that box is checked. That's unchecked. That's checked. Make sure when you're saving your files, you include the color profile. That goes whether you're using Photoshop or Lightroom or Elements or any other photo editing software. When you're saving your pictures, make sure that you embed the color profile, okay? In Photoshop, there's also the group of color settings. And these color settings, when you open this dialog box, again, it was under the edit menu, when you open color settings, this looks a little bit daunting at first until you understand what we're looking at here. The first section here is about working spaces. Okay, this is our working on our master files. This isn't so much about saving files as JPEGs or converting them to something else. This is about what's our master file format. In photography, you're really mainly only concerned about RGB. So you would set your working space either to sRGB, Profoto, if you know what that is, or Adobe RGB is the best for most people for a working RGB space. Over here on the conversion options, it's fine just to leave these at their defaults in Photoshop. And then last but not least down here on color management policies, we want to make sure that Photoshop will preserve any profiles that have already been saved within your images. You do have options here to open a dialog box if Photoshop finds a mismatch between your working RGB space and if you're opening a file with a different color space, then Photoshop will ask you about it, okay? So you don't really need to do too much in color settings, but as you get more serious about color management, I would encourage you to get into this dialog box and learn a little bit more. You can see that when I move my mouse over different areas in this screen. Down at the bottom of the window, it changes to tell me a little bit more about what that means. Okay, so learn about the Photoshop color settings. Now, in Lightroom, there are no internal color settings. Lightroom manages the color internally, automatically. Whatever color space the file happens to be in, Lightroom will respect it. And if you're using a color calibrated display, you can trust what you're seeing on the screen in Lightroom. Again, this is the main thing. We wanna be able to trust what we see on screen. So in Lightroom, there are some settings that have to do with color and mainly that is in how this file would be handed off to Photoshop or another external editor. So again, we're in Lightroom preferences on the Mac have gone under the Lightroom menu. On Windows, it's under the edit menu, preferences. And this says when we edit this file in Adobe Photoshop, and again, this is when Lightroom is going to send it over to Photoshop, what color space to use. So you can choose from, don't ever use display, incidentally, use sRGB, Adobe RGB, or Profoto. Those are your working spaces. And as I said a minute ago, for your master working files that you're editing or processing, use Adobe RGB. Okay, so that's all you get for the color settings in Lightroom. And again, that just has to do with when it goes over into Photoshop. Now, 
both Photoshop and Lightroom give you the ability to preview what the image will look like when it's printed. And this is called soft proofing. I'm in the Lightroom develop module and I've got the toolbar visible here. If the toolbar is not visible, go under the view menu and make sure that the toolbar is showing. And when you click soft proofing, now you see at the upper right of the develop module, it's showing what it will look like when it's printed on this canvas. So you can add different color profiles. These are printer profiles, which we're gonna talk more about in just a second. You add your color profiles into the list, printer profiles, and then you can see by changing these options, the intent, perceptual, or relative, and choosing a different profile, by choosing simulate paper and ink, we're now actually having Lightroom display on screen what this will look like when it's printed to that canvas. So you can see very clearly that on this printer and canvas that it looks a little bit flat and washed out compared to on a premium luster paper or on an Epson hot press natural paper. So you can see how each one shows a little differently. So by being able to preview what the print will look like when it's made, you can actually make adjustments to a copy specifically for that paper and printer combination. Now in Photoshop, that setting is found under the view menu, under proof setup, and you can go custom, device to simulate, these are all the printer profiles loaded on this computer. So if I choose one of the, let's say Epson hot press bright, and then you check and uncheck preview, you can see that Photoshop is simulating what this will look like printed to that paper and printer. This is where I said earlier how it takes a little bit of training your eyes, right? So after you do a soft proof and you make some slight adjustments for your proof condition, then you make a test print and you compare it to what you see on screen. And over a short amount of time, you will train your eye to understand what you're looking at on screen so that when you do a soft proof, you can have a very high degree of certainty that what you print is going to look like that. Bear with me here. Okay, so then we come to printer profiles. Absolutely crucial piece of the puzzle here if you're making prints. Now, I hope you can understand that if you're not making prints, well, you should be, but if you're not making prints and just uploading photos online and sharing them that way, that you need to be able to trust what you see on your screen. You need to save your files as sRGB and then you're done. But for printer profiling or for making good prints, you need to understand about how these profiles work. And in some cases, you may need to get some custom profiles. Sorry, just let me take a quick drink here. For starters, let me just explain that a printer profile, otherwise known as an ICC profile, is actually a combination of printer and paper because when a printer profile is created, it is specific to the printer that it was made on and the paper that it was made on. The photo to the right here shows the i1 Studio being used to measure test targets to create a printer profile for that Epson printer in the background. You can get pre-built profiles from paper manufacturers and to some degree from printer manufacturers, but understand that those are obviously not made on your printer those are made on somebody else's printer, but it will get you most of the way there. You can make custom profiles either yourself or get somebody else to do it for you using systems like the i1 Studio. And with these custom printer profiles, then you can be very sure of the accuracy because it's made specifically for your printer using that paper. And then, as we just looked at, you can load that custom profile in as a soft proof in Lightroom and Photoshop, and you can see what your prints will look like before you make them. To make a printer profile, all that's required is to print a set of these calibration targets or color patches, 
and then uh, measure them using the device. And obviously, there are considerations for your lighting and the viewing con conditions. And so there are some settings within the software to actually make different profiles for different viewing conditions. So this is um, the i1 Studio kit that I keep mentioning, which, as I said, is, is kind of my current favorite. Um, it's, it's great value at the price point, and it can do pretty much everything a photographer would need. Uh, it comes with a color target here that allows you to actually create a camera profile as well. So you can use a custom camera profile in Lightroom. The i1 Studio also calibrates and profiles uh, displays, printers, and projectors. Now, I haven't talked a lot about projectors to this point, but if you're in a camera club or you're in a situation where you're seeing your images projected quite a lot, then you should know that it is possible to profile a, a device such as that as well. And camera clubs uh, more and more are uh, using systems like the i1 Studio to calibrate and profile projectors. So we have a few key takeaways here. You need to know that color management is already built into your computer, but it requires that you actually use it. And you do that by using a kit. You need some type of device to measure your display and to show you correct colors and then potentially to create custom profiles. For the best printing quality, first, you need to calibrate and profile dis your display. I mentioned before how an, a digital image file actually contains fixed numeric values. Well, you need to be able to trust what you see on your monitor, that it's showing you those true values. Once you've got that part done, the rest of it gets a lot easier. When you're saving your files, you need to make sure to embed the profiles for your working spaces. Now, it's important to make a distinction here that a raw file from your camera does not have a working space. It doesn't have a color space at all. It literally is just raw camera data. But if you're saving a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG from that raw file, then you need to embed the profile. If you're printing for yourself, you need to make sure that you're using the correct printer profiles. If you don't have custom profiles, then you need to get the right ones from the paper manufacturer. If you're using a third-party paper like PhotoSpeed or Permajet or Pinnacle, you can get profiles directly from them for most printer models. Or if you get the i1 Studio, you can do it yourself. You can also use these profiles for soft proofing, even if you're not printing yourself. You can load in uh, printer profiles for a vendor and adjust the profiles for their printing. And so you, you'll be even more certain when you send your files that it will be what you expect. When you're sharing pictures on screen, again, this is uh, a, a smartphone, a tablet, a, a computer screen, a TV projector. Calibrate and profile your own display. Control what you can. You need to be able to trust what you see on screen. Save your files always using the sRGB color space if they're going to be viewed on screen. Make sure to embed the profile. I mentioned earlier about checking your software settings. You know, once you have gone to the trouble and expense and time to profile your monitor, you need to sort of keep up with it and make a new display profile, maybe every month, maybe every six months. Check your software settings. Be really clear when you're working in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever software that your, your color settings are correct for your intended output. Adobe and XWrite are keen to make this easier for everybody. There is an offer on through 31st December where you can get a full year of the Adobe Creative Cloud Photography Plan which is great, great value. That comes with full version of Photoshop, full versions of Lightroom, uh, both uh, Lightroom CC and Classic. So you get all the photo stuff from Adobe uh, with the purchase of any of these devices. 
um, there's the, the URL, xrightphoto.eu slash Adobe. So I'm Nat Colson. Um, I am happy now to take some questions. Here's my contact details. If you want to learn more about um, color management and photography and editing and everything uh, uh, related to photography and especially photography as art, uh, find me online. I'm going to hide out of this for a second and open my questions and I am now ready to take some questions. So I've got a few loaded in here. Okay, first question here. Do you calibrate your monitor within a dark environment? Yes and no. And that's a, a little bit of a tricky question. It is true that your environment will affect the way that you see the colors on screen. And these calibration devices, if you look at the top, like of the, the X-Rite um, i1 display that's on the left of these, these products, that top lens is actually for measuring ambient light. So that's what we're talking about here. Whether your room is dark or light, what's the color? Is it sunlight coming in from a window? Is it um, a, a lamp on the side of your desk? Whatever the light is around your display, that's the ambient light. So ambient light is a consideration, but you'll find that as you start training your eye, and again, presuming that your display is properly calibrated to begin with, that ambient light really, in my view, has a very small role in this whole thing. That being said, if I'm getting ready to do some serious photo editing and color correcting an image for a very crucial print project, I will work with all of my interior lights turned off just because in my office or my studio space where I you know, work on my uh, photos, I've got several different types of lighting. I've got overhead tungsten lighting, uh, or I've got, sorry, on the desk I've got tungsten lighting, I've got a, a daylight calibrated lamp, I've got overhead halogen lighting. And so what I want is as few distractions and as neutral lighting as I can. But no, it doesn't have to be dark. Um, I guess ideally you wouldn't want the sun coming in and shining directly on your monitor. But aside from that, I really think that the ambient lighting is not that crucial. Now, as far as the calibration process goes, the device is resting against your screen and the way that it measures the color patches, it should not be influenced really at all by the ambient light. It's only measuring what's being transmitted from the screen. So I hope that that's kind of a long answer. Um, I hope that answers your question there. Um, how important part of the workflow is soft proofing? Um, it depends on how crucial the print job is and what type of media you're using. If you're not at all sure, like if you're using a canvas and you've got really dark shadows or really saturated colors, then absolutely I would do a soft proof because I don't really trust that the, the canvas and even the custom profile can hit all of the colors and the tones accurately. So for crucial jobs or for funny type of media or you know unusual materials absolutely I soft proof if you're using photo paper that has a very wide gamut like it can reproduce deep blacks and a wide range of colors you may find that after doing a couple of soft proofs that you've got a good handle on what you're looking at and you don't really need to soft proof every time so I would say that probably for 99% of my sort of straight photo prints I don't soft proof them, but for the majority of prints on art paper or canvas or other specialist media, yes, I do soft proof. Uh, what else do we have here? What do I do when a file gets sent to a printer? I can't influence it there. Um, we talked about saving your working space profile. So if you're sending a TIFF or a JPEG, make sure to embed the profile. And that would be done based on your print provider's recommendations. Obviously, all print services are not created equal. 
And you want to be working with a company that has good color management practices and can actually produce good color. So if you're struggling with your current vendor, then look elsewhere. There are plenty of companies online who charge, you know, very low prices for good quality printing at, and, you know, it's, it's color managed. But unfortunately, some labs actually have very poor color management policies. So first rule is if your, your lab is not really well color managed and they can't talk about it intelligently, go somewhere else. If you're working with a lab that has their color management procedures really in line, then they'll have information on their website about how they want the files prepared. Normally, they'll say use Adobe RGB if it's inkjet. If it's going to be a chromogenic print, like a traditional photo print, like a standard lab style print, not inkjet, then use sRGB for those. If you use the correct color space and you embed the profile, then you'll have far fewer surprises when you send the files to a lab. Uh, do I have advice on the use of D50 or D65 white point? I always use D50. That may sound counterintuitive because the, uh, the screen display actually is calibrated to D65, but the fact is that D65 is closer to a uh, native white point for monitors, whereas D50 is more of a standard for uh, viewing booths and controlled um, reflective viewing conditions. So D65 on the display settings, D50 for your prof printer profiles. Uh, what lighting conditions do I use for viewing my prints? Well, I try and view them under a range of conditions so I can really understand kind of what's happening. Uh, and that's one way that you can evaluate different types of paper as well. Um, I do have a daylight calibrated desk lamp and it uses a bulb from a company called Otlite. That's O-T-T-L-I-T-E. Otlite makes uh, a wide range of um, fluorescent bulbs that you can put in all kinds of, of uh, lights. And so you can have something relatively close to daylight calibrated viewing light. I think that that's a really good reference. And if you're using D50 for your profiles and a daylight calibrated light source, then you're going to be getting a, a close match in your viewing conditions. Uh, as I said, though, I do also try and view the prints under other conditions because when I sell a print, uh, to a private collector or a hotel or a corporate office, I have no control over the lighting conditions that is going to be used. And even in a, a gallery type situation, you really can't be sure that the lighting is going to be great. So look at your print. And again, do a, a smaller test print, of course, and presuming maybe you've done some soft proofing. Um, do a small test print and look at it in normal daylight you know, outside, look at it in uh, north facing window light indoors, look at it under tungsten light, you know, try and really see in different conditions. And you may find that certain paper uh, combinations really uh, react uh, not very well to different lighting. So that is one of the characteristics of the paper. Uh, another question here, when soft proofing in Lightroom and colors look washed out, on a particular media? Do you re-edit or choose a different media? I'm going to switch back into Lightroom real quick to address this. This obviously looks washed out, right? This is what the image really looks like. This is what it looks like soft proofed, okay? The shadows have gone really muddy, okay? It doesn't look very good at all. But the fact is that the main reason for the difference between soft proofing and not is because of the characteristics of a display versus the canvas. If I print this image on this canvas without doing any adjustments whatsoever, it's actually going to look pretty decent because the blacks on the canvas will be as black as the printer can make. But those blacks are never going to be black like a display. On a, a computer display, black is the complete absence of light. Okay, there's no light 
being emitted at all. And so black on your computer screen is something that you can not really always hope to achieve on a print. But I do know that in these areas that it's getting really dark shadows and close to solid black, that on the printer it is actually going to be solid black. So this is one of the areas where training your eye is necessary. I'm not necessarily looking for this canvas profile to look exactly like my unproofed reference copy. What I'm looking for is to make sure that in the shadows here, I can see enough detail so that the, the shadows and the blacks aren't getting all blocked up and muddy. I'm looking to make sure that the image has a good amount of saturation. And so on a canvas print, I know from experience that I need to open up the shadows quite a bit to reveal more detail in there. And I need to really pump up the saturation. But I wouldn't necessarily be put off from printing it to that media just because of how it looks on the screen. Because again, you really got to start training your eye. And this is a, a, a bit of expertise involved in knowing that even though we're asking the display to simulate what that print will look like, that there's only so far that it can actually do that. Okay, so no, I would not be put off by printing this. I would just go into the basic adjustments and open up the shadows more and probably, probably add a bunch of saturation. On canvas, I always add like plus 20, plus 30 kind of saturation. And then make a small test print if you're not sure. Then you can bring the test print up next to your display and really start to understand the result, what happens when you print the file with that settings to that profile. I've got time just for one more question here. What paper types are rendering colors the best? That is a, a very kind of unanswerable question. Um, there are, is such a wide range of paper manufacturers and um, products out there that a little bit of trial and error is going to be required. But to the question specifically about matte gloss, semi-gloss, there should really be no difference in the surface finish as to how it will uh, render a range of colors or the, the respective color gamut. What really matters on th those types of, of surfaces is how the ink, the, how the paper responds to the ink, how the ink sits on the surface or and, and penetrates within the surface. Generally speaking, a totally matte finish fine art paper will have quite a smaller gamut than a glossy or luster photo paper. So if you want a, a simple answer for that, then looking at sort of a luster finish paper or semi-gloss uh, would be the best starting point for the widest possible gamut. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope this has been really helpful. I can't thank you enough for your time today. I appreciate all the questions. Um, you can uh, get in touch with me directly here, uh, either at photographicdesignworkshop.com or through my main website, natcolson.com. I do uh, send out newsletters and I do uh, training events kind of year round. So hopefully get in touch. Thank you all again and uh, good luck. I look forward to hearing from you again. Take care. Bye.